Chapter Four of Ten from Infinity by Paul W. Fairman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Karen Savage. Dr. Rudolph Entman, one of the world's foremost neurologists, stripped off his rubber gloves and scowled at the strange body that lay on the table before him. God damn it, he fumed. It's artificially constructed. It's been handmade, manufactured. And there's one thing I'd give a few years of my life to know. Brent Tabor stared moodily into Entman's myopic little eyes and asked, "'What's that, doctor?' "'How in hell did they do it?' "'Who do you suppose they are?' Entman looked ceilingward in a manner that indicated he might either be hunting for them somewhere out beyond, or sending a prayer heavenward in a plea for divine counsel and guidance. "'Some form of entity with far greater intelligence than we possess.' "'You can tell me more than that, can't you?' Brand asked sharply. And when Dr. Entman looked up in surprise, he added, "'Sorry for the tone. My nerves have gotten a little edgy lately.' Entman smiled understandingly. "'I don't wonder. As to this living machine—no, it's not a machine, because it did live. Let's see what we can figure out. What's it made of? The material used in its construction is—oh, hell, how can I put it? This way, maybe.' Take a wool blanket and call it genuine flesh, blood, and bone. Now take a blanket made out of one of the new synthetics, dacron or one of the other equally serviceable materials. Call that the material this creature is made of. Figuring it that way— You mean our visitor's body is constructed of things that feel and look like flesh, blood, and bone, work as well, but aren't, right? Right. But of course that doesn't tell you anything you didn't know before. But what about their potentials, their capabilities? They're human, in the sense that they're exact duplicates of humans, and they live. But what about emotions? If we accept the somewhat unscientific theory that it's a soul which is responsible for feelings and emotions, these—these creatures would be handicapped. Brent paused, as if uncertain of his ground. Wouldn't they? he asked lamely. I mean, they couldn't— theoretically at least, react to situations, or other people's emotions. Dr. Entman nodded his head and murmured, I would be inclined to agree, except that we're obviously dealing with superior intelligence. I'm talking about the people responsible for these androids, and we have no idea how far they might have progressed in duplicating that indefinable something we call a soul. For a moment he lapsed into silence then looked up at Brent abruptly. "'Have you read anything on Kendrick's experiments with synthetic emotion?' "'Can't say that I have.' "'Kendrick, down at Penton Technological Institute, has done some remarkable things in drawing the stuff of human emotion from one person, holding it on a tape, and transferring it to another person.' "'On the face of it, that sounds ridiculous.' "'Doesn't it? Nevertheless, the vibrations set up or created, you might say, by a person in anger, consist of some sort of stuff, in the sense of an incredibly high frequency wave. Radio or television waves are the best comparisons. Kendrick, in one demonstration, took a young man who was very much in love with a certain young lady, a really lovesick lad. He placed him in the recording unit, gave him the young lady's picture, and told him to let his mind dwell on her to the exclusion of all else. Dr. Entman smiled briefly. This, I imagine, wasn't difficult for the lad to do. Entman then put another young man, one who was unacquainted with the girl, into a receiving unit, and exposed him, after giving him the girl's picture, to the vibrations created by the lovelorn chap. Later they saw to it that the second lad was introduced to the girl. The results were rather startling, in that the young lady suddenly had two ardent suitors in place of one. Brent Tabor scratched his ear and looked dubious. "'That sounds pretty sensational. But maybe the second lad just plain happened to fall in love with the girl by natural processes.' "'True. But the experiments tended to eliminate that possibility. Other emotions were tested. How about a man walking up to a man he'd never seen before in his life and busting him in the nose?' "'Okay, okay. Then you think—' "'I think a lot of things.' Here I see the possibility of a race with superior science, having moved far ahead of us in the directions Kendrick is pointing toward in his research. 
For instance, with more advanced knowledge and know-how, they've probably been able to charge a synthetic body with a complete set of functioning emotional responses. Grant them that, and we can also concede a tailor-made ego." "'I don't mind admitting I'm scared, Doctor,' Brent Tabor said. "'I think it's a time to be scared. But if a race of people were that advanced, if their intention is hostile, why do they pussyfoot around this way? Why don't they just come down and take us over?" I've wondered that, too. And yet a race on some planet out there in the universe might not evolve according to what we consider a logical pattern. What do you mean? I mean that while they can create a synthetic man, their interests, and therefore their progress, may have stayed in peaceful channels. For instance, they may not have bothered with anything as elementary as the atom bomb. It's a thought. A wishful thought, I'll admit, but it does have some validity. Also, it has a fact of some possible value to back it up. What fact? That they haven't come down and taken us over. You almost cheer me, Doctor. Almost, but not quite. Actually, Entman said, I've been wondering about something else. What's that? When and how they came here before. You mean, where did they get the model for the ten androids? Yes. They had to have not only a model, but also some knowledge concerning our geographical and atmospheric conditions. The two hearts indicate that they knew the elements contained in our air, the pressures and so forth necessary to our existence, and were unable to construct a working model that would function under our conditions with a single heart. So they put in two. It looks as though they missed on some other things, too. Seven of the androids have expired." Entman shrugged. Still. A remarkable job, particularly since they would have had no chance for a trial-and-error test under the conditions that would prevail. It's surprising that any of the androids were able to keep functioning. The eighth one is pretty sick. He may be gone by now. And about their earlier coming, I can give you one point. They came quietly, probably at night, grabbed their model, and moved out fast. How do you know that? Because, obviously, they think all men on Earth look alike. Or at least we can assume that. Else, how did they expect to get away with ten identical androids?" Entman's eyes widened. "'I never thought of that,' he muttered. Senator Crane, a doggedly determined man, had listened to the replay of Brent Tabor's top-secret conference again and again. In the comfortable rationalization of which he was capable, his whole zeal and hostility were fashioned around Brent's arrogant disregard of democratic processes. Who did this bureaucrat think he was? Did he consider himself smarter than the people? Did he feel they couldn't be trusted with revelations affecting their survival? Well, by God, they'd been trusted with word of the bomb and its implications, and they'd reacted admirably. So they were entitled to frankness concerning this new threat to their security. Of course, Senator Crane reserved the right to enlighten them in his own time, and in his own way. After all, hadn't they elected him, and thus given him leeway to use his own judgment in their best interests? But who the hell had elected Brent Tabor? Nobody. So Crane listened to the recording, and picked out what he classified as the key lines. A routine autopsy revealed some peculiar things. The man had two hearts. The blood? Could it have been a new kind of plasma? All in all, gentlemen, eight identical specimens have been picked up in various American cities. Exactly alike. Crane ran through the rest of it, and threw himself moodily into a chair. The idiots! The stupid, unelected, self-appointed guardians of democracy! Not once, not once, mind you, had a single one of these great brains referred to the obvious. It was a Russian plot! All those allusions to the extraterrestrial were so much bilge. The Russians were infiltrating the country with synthetic men. This meant—oh, God! It meant that in a short time Russia would be able to create an army of these monsters and overwhelm the world. Senator Crane sprang to his feet and measured his indignation in long strides across the thick, expensive carpeting on his floor. The traitor! the sheer compulsive opportunist. That was certainly all that Brent Tabor could be called. Using this deadly situation as a means of furthering his own interests. 
Senator Crane deliberately stilled his rage and objectively considered what he should do about it. With the obvious source of the androids logically deduced, there was only his own defensive procedures to be considered. And they had to be considered carefully. As he saw himself, he stood alone, against a group of bumbling idiots with the future of the nation at stake. What to do? The key question, of course, was, how soon will Russia be able to mount an army? Probably not very soon, he decided. That fact gave him time to ferret out more information, to become completely sure of himself. One thing you had to realize about the American public, or about any mass of humanity for that matter, a thing of importance had to be presented dramatically. This, in a sense, was the duty of the elected public servant, to recognize this somewhat childish failing of the average intelligence and make allowances for it. You can do this, of course, Senator Crane told himself, when you love the people. And fortunately for their survival, Senator Crane loved the American people. So for a few moments he o'erleaped the hard work ahead and saw the goal, envisioned the headlines. Senator Crane uncovers deadly peril to the nation. Due entirely to the patriotic, selfless efforts of one United States Senator, the nation has been warned in time of— Senator Crane stuns Congress and the nation with his revelations. Standing alone on the rostrum, a heroic figure pitted, as it were, against all the sinister forces that bore from within, one valiant United States Senator. Crane had dropped back into his chair. His eyes had closed, the better to visualize a grateful nation expending their plaudits. And because he was a man who used a great deal of energy in pursuing an objective, he tired at times. He became drowsy now, and went gently to sleep. End of chapter 4